Hello and welcome to part four of the pathophysiology section of the online EMT course. In the previous sections we have exhaustively covered ventilation. In this lesson we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about perfusion. Let's get started. As emergency healthcare providers, we give a lot of attention to the cardiovascular system, both in the class and in the field. We're very careful to fully assess cardiovascular function and issues associated with the system are treated as life-threatening emergencies. Now that's all fine and dandy, and I don't mean to imply that the body system is unimportant, but in reality, our cardiovascular system is simply the mechanism by which we move material through the body. Its function is transportation and delivery. Here, let me show you using this illustration. The cardiovascular system is composed of the heart, blood vessels, and the blood. Blood moving through the lungs loads up with oxygen and gives up CO2. Then that blood returns to the heart where it's pumped through the systemic circuit to all of the cells in the body. At the cellular level, that oxygen leaves the blood and enters the cells, and it picks up CO2, which it brings back to the lung. But that's not the entire picture. Although not represented in this illustration, remember, our circulatory system also transports nutrients, waste products from the cells to the kidneys for removal, hormones from endocrine glands to their target organs, immune elements to the site of an injury or infection, and there are even more materials that are being transported around. So it's all about transport and delivery. But if this rapid transit system fails, big problems are going to happen relatively quickly. Now let's talk a little about how this system is able to respond to changing situations in the body. You see, our perfusion needs change constantly. The circulatory system is constantly compensating for these changes. Simple actions like standing up after sitting for a while or increases in physical activity require changes in cardiovascular function. We'll start by talking about the heart. Back in the A&P section, I discussed heart adatomy. Today I'm going to talk about the dynamics of heart function. First, the heart can actually alter the amount of blood it pumps in a few different ways. First, it can change rate, either slow down or speed it up. Next, the heart can actually increase the amount of blood it pumps with each contraction. This is called stroke volume. Finally, it can vary the force by which it contracts. More forceful contraction propels the blood under greater pressure. So by altering any one of these, I can actually increase or decrease cardiac output. Now there are two other factors you need to know about that affects the heart's pumping ability. They're called preload and afterload. Preload is the amount of blood returning to the heart. Two things about this. First, the heart can only pump as much blood as it receives. Let's say you got 50 milliliters of blood entering the heart. Well, that's the most it can pump. So if anything drops preload, like maybe bleeding, the heart will not be able to pump as much blood. Now there's another side to preload, and this may sound kind of funny, but the heart's not too smart. It'll work its butt off to pump all the blood coming back from the body. So if preload increases, heart workload increases. Basically, the heart is trying to move that blood on so that it doesn't pile up in the vasculature. This can be really dangerous if the heart is very sick, like if somebody's having a heart attack. One of the things doctors often try to do is decrease heart work in these situations. So they may use a drug that actually decreases preload. Now the other factor that affects heart work is afterload. This is the amount of pressure in the blood vessels leaving the heart. If there's a lot of pressure built up, like let's say in a person with high blood pressure, 
The heart workload goes up as it attempts to overcome this pressure to empty. Now afterload is largely dependent upon blood vessel size and we're going to talk about that next. Back in A&P I discussed vascular resistance, but let's do a quick review. When the smooth muscle in a blood vessel contracts, vascular resistance increases. This also increases the pressure in the vessel. This would represent the condition I just mentioned about increased afterload. So the heart's going to have to pump very hard to overcome the pressure in these vessels to move that blood forward. On the other hand, when a blood vessel dilates, vascular resistance falls, as does pressure. So medications that dilate blood vessels can be used to decrease afterload. Now while we're on the topic of pressure, recall that the blood in a vessel always exerts pressure on that vessel's wall. That pressure can be measured. The measurement of pressure when the heart is contracting is called systolic pressure. And the pressure when the heart is relaxed is called diastolic pressure. When we record a blood pressure, it's recorded as systolic over diastolic, for example, 140 over 80. One last thing, the difference in these two values is called pulse pressure. So in our example BP here, the pulse pressure would be 62. 142 minus 80 equals 62. All right. We've talked about the heart and the blood vessels, so now we're going to discuss the blood. Recall, blood can be divided into its two basic components, plasma, the liquid part, and what are known as the formed elements, which is made up of the blood cells. Blood is the actual vehicle in which substances are transported and the components facilitate that transportation. Now, in addition to the blood pressure we discussed earlier, there's two other pressures you need to understand. Hydrostatic pressure. This is related to the blood's pressure on the walls. If the pressure gets too high, it is actually possible that fluid can be forced out of the vessel. This is especially possible in the capillary beds. So increases in hydrostatic pressure can result in a loss of fluid, which is a loss of blood. The other pressure you may hear about is something called plasma oncotic pressure. Back in those capillaries I just mentioned, you'll actually find that they're really kind of leaky, even under normal pressures. To help to combat this leakage, there are these large protein molecules in our blood that actually attract fluid. Kind of like gravity exerts a pull on objects. So these proteins prevent leakage from the capillaries, and that's what's meant by oncotic pressure the actual pull of these, of these particles on the fluids. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of different factors that can be done to alter cardiovascular function. From heart rate, to heart contraction, to blood vessel size changes, just any number of things can affect our cardiovascular output. But what's controlling it? Did you say the autonomic nervous system? Good, you're correct. Here's how it works. There are monitors in the blood vessels throughout the body called baroreceptors. Baroreceptors measure pressure. So, if a receptor identifies that pressure in a vessel is low, it sends a signal in the brain, which in turn activates one of those mechanisms to raise the pressure back up. 
It might increase heart rate. It might increase cardiac output. It may constrict the blood vessel or any combination to meet the need. If pressures are too high, they send a signal and the opposite actions occur. Additionally, there are chemoreceptors. Remember those? They monitor things like CO2 levels and pH and those kind of things. You recall that these actually drive our breathing, but they also impact the cardiovascular system. For example, high CO2 levels would actually increase circulation so that carbon dioxide could be returned to the lungs for removal. All right, now this is a good time to introduce a new term, homeostasis. Homeostasis is defined as a state of dynamic equilibrium. What the hell does that mean? Well, here's what it means. Our body tries to maintain balance. And balance means that we don't allow things to get too high or too low. They're moving constantly, but we're going to keep them from getting too far out of whack. Let's use temperature for an example. If you get too cold, you die. If you get too hot, well, you die. So our body tries to keep temperature between those two levels. So if our body temperature starts to climb, you're outside, it's a hot day, you're exerting yourself, your nervous system will take actions to cool you down, like sweating. If it's a really cold day and you start to get too cold, your nervous system will kick in mechanisms to increase heat production, like shivering. Note that in all of these things I'm describing, we're talking about stopping a trend. In other words, if something goes up, the body brings it back down. If it goes down, the body brings it back up. This is referred to as a negative feedback system. That means it reverses a trend, and that's what homeostatic mechanisms do. Again, if something's getting too high, they bring it back down into range. If it gets too low, they push it back up, always keeping it within the parameters that are conducive to life and health. Okay, we're on the home stretch here. Now let's talk about cardiovascular mechanisms available in times of crisis. Let's say your patient has a major bleed due to an injury. As they lose blood, the ability of the cardiovascular system to meet the body's needs is going to be negatively affected, right? It may be so bad that the general compensatory mechanisms we've been describing by using the heart and the blood vessels may not be able to keep up with the body's needs. Oh my God, are we going to die? Well, maybe. But there is one last tool that we can use. We can shunt blood. That means we can actually cut off blood supply to one organ and route it to a more important organ system. An example is rerouting blood from the gut to the brain. So let's say organ one here is the gut and organ two is the brain. So if I just shut off blood flow here, that blood's going to keep on going continue down the line and it's now available to perfuse organ two. That's a pretty cool system. Well, unless you're organ one. Then it kind of sucks. But the fact is, the body will actually risk sacrificing one organ system to save a more vital system. Hopefully, the EMT is going to show up and fix the problem so we can also restore perfusion to organ one. Well, let me show you how this really works in the body. Shunning actually happens way down here at the capillary bed level. Little sphincter muscles are controlled by the autonomic nervous system, and in a crisis situation, these muscles contract and they stop blood from entering this capillary bed. It then keeps on going until it reaches an open bed somewhere further down the line. Now think for a minute about the cells perfused in this stagnant capillary bed. Here, let's draw some cells. They're not going to receive any oxygen or nutrients. And the CO2 and the waste are going to build up here because there's no transportation to remove it. 
eventually these cells are toast. And that's what I meant when I said this is a sacrificial system. It's used only as a last resort by the body in cases where actual survival is threatened. All right, that's a pretty thorough overview of the cardiovascular system and how it functions to meet our changing perfusion needs. Next time, we're going to wrap up pathophysiology.